Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 16. If you're using the Pew Bible, you'll find it on page 875, Luke chapter 16. We're kind of in the middle of this series that we've entitled Lost and Found, and the reason is because in Luke chapter 15, we, we discover a, a series of parables that Jesus has, has taught or was teaching to describe the joy of heaven, the joy of heaven over one sinner who repents more than 99 righteous who need no repentance. Of course, he's addressing his audience, uh, an audience that was full of sinners and tax collectors on one hand and scribes and Pharisees on the other. And, and he's, he's calling both groups, actually, to enjoy and participate fellowship that can happen only through repentance of sin. I wonder, even now, even here in our in our fellowship this morning, if there's anyone who has never come to a place of recognizing their sin, of coming to a place of seeing that, that their sin has separated them from God, and, and, and sees in the Father, in Jesus, uh, a willingness not only to forgive sin, but to cleanse and restore and to draw them into fellowship with his Son through Forgiveness of sin and salvation. I, I wonder, even in this moment, before we, before we even get into the text this morning, if you might do business with God and ask for forgiveness of your sin and to enter into fellowship with the Father. Jesus, of course, is interested in the hearts of those to whom he's ministering, both the sinners and tax collectors and the scribe and Pharisee. And, and now in Luke chapter 16, he, he's turning his attention now to his disciples. He has something very important for them to know. And it's my conviction that, that Jesus is turning to his disciples right after these series of parables so that he can help them understand something important about stewardship. Something important about, about how we steward the things that God has granted to us as a, as a reflection of our heart, as an indication of where we really are as relates to following after Jesus. We understand something about stewardship. We, we know about stewardship. Uh, you know, today, Pastor David and Brenda will be traveling by plane down to Florida. So imagine that you, that you were there with them and you're at the airport, you, you understand the significance of, of pilots, and if you ever, ever looked into the cockpit, you, you know all the sophisticated gadgetry that's there, the buttons and knobs and the levers you have to push just at the right way and touch at the right time so that you can get that plane off the ground and safely to its destination. Well, remember, just imagine for a moment that that, that you're sitting there in the, the waiting room uh, waiting for the, 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 to board the plane and you overhear this conversation between two passengers who are also planning to travel. And these passengers have inside information about the pilot that's going to be piloting this plane. They've discovered that this pilot has failed his Federal Aviation Administration written test. And he's, you've, you've also discovered that all of his in-flight hours are actually done, were actually done on a flight simulator in his parents' basement. <laughs> Instantly, <laughs> you are gripped with anxiety. You have a decision to make, and maybe it's a pretty easy decision for all of us in the room. We recognize the significance of stewardship and the principle that's going to come right out of the beginning of our passage in verse 10 those who are faithful in little will be faithful in much if you're going to pilot a plane with hundreds of souls on board hundreds of lives that are dependent on you you would trust in the fact that there is some previous stewardship in much smaller things that has led to this monumental task of getting individuals from one place to the other. As you grapple with the, these concerns of, of deciding whether or not to get on board, you, you come to recognize that trust is built into the foundation of everyday interactions. That even boarding a plane and navigating life's challenges are dependent upon trusting individuals. The competence of this pilot, the safety of those who are under his charge, 
We understand that trust is important, but we also know that trust is not blind. It's earned through competence, integrity, reliability. So it's natural for us to question the competence of a pilot who's only done all of his flight hours in the basement on a flight simulator in his parents' basement. We understand that in the realm of faith, trust takes even deeper significance as we look to our Lord Jesus. We see in the scripture the testimony of a faithful God, not only the declarative statements that talk about his faithfulness and call us to know him as a faithful, as a true, as a consistent God, but we see the pattern of his interactions with his people throughout the course of time, and we see, in fact, that God is dependable, that God is trustworthy, that God can be trusted. And so the declarative statements of who God is align with the clear activity of God and the consistent pattern of faithfulness that we see in him. And we come to appreciate then that those who would call themselves believers, those who walk in the steps of Jesus, those who are disciples of God, must also emulate the pattern we see in Christ. As stewards, we must also be faithful. We must walk in his steps. We're empowered by his Holy Spirit. We follow his word. We are those who look to heavenly things, not set our eyes and attention on earthly things. So this morning, as we pick up on the truth of faithfulness, we we come to realize that that stewardship is, is so significant that it will lead us to heaven. The stewardship, the kind of stewardship that Jesus is advocating here is the kind of stewardship that will lead us to heaven. Not only for you personally, as you come to understand who you are in relation to God, but as you seek to steward the things that God is, the good gifts that God has entrusted to us and seek to draw others, as, as we find in our passage from last week, making friends for ourselves for heaven, as it were. Last week, we looked at this parable in Luke chapter 16 of this shrewd servant, and we we, we, we understand that, that this parable has caused a great deal of trouble. Even in our own minds as we've read through, how is it that this master can commend this dishonest servant? In a parable, we find this manager who was given responsibility over a portion of his master's farming empire. The house manager would have authority to act on behalf of the master in, in doing trades, buying and selling, and in doing transactions on, the, on behalf of his master. We find that, that there's accusations that are brought against this manager that, that it's, it's become known in the community and by the other servants that are working for this master that this house manager is wasting his master's possessions. Now, we're not told how he was wasting it, whether he was wasting it on himself or he was wasting it in poor business decisions, but, but the accusation is significant enough that he is going to be essentially terminated from employment. The master comes to him and tells him to close out the books, tells him to settle accounts. It's going to be turned over to another individual. This manager, seeing the prospects of his future, and recognizing his own limitations, comes to a place of of contemplating in his own heart. We we kind of get this inside look in verse 3. It says he knows he's not strong enough to dig. He doesn't like manual labor. He's been doing the cushy job of managing uh, business and managing money. He he doesn't want to work. And he knows he's too proud to beg. So he decides to take advantage of this last business transaction. He's going to obligate his master's debtors to himself. He's going to do this by reducing the price and by giving them a favor. He's in in exchange expecting a favor in return. In verses 6 and 7, we find the the significance of of what they owe, 100 measures of oil, which had been equivalent to about 875 gallons of oil, 150 trees worth of yield, About a 1,000 denarii, and a denarii is one day's wage. So about three years to to finally pay off this debt. Then 100 measures of wheat, which had been about 100 acres of yield, between 2,500 and 3,000 denarii. So between eight to 10 years to pay off such a debt. So he reduces 
the price of both of these so that the result is about 500 denarii for each situation. About 500 days per transaction that he's reduced these debts. Effectively now he, he is putting his debtors in debt to him. He expects a favor. Surprisingly, as the master becomes aware of what's taken place and he comes to this steward, we find that instead of condemning him, he commends him. Notice in verse eight, the master commends the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Jesus, of, of course, is not commending his dishonesty. He is commending his shrewdness of using the wealth of this world, the unrighteous wealth as it's described here, and we'll talk about that more as we go, putting it to work to establish friendships and relationships in this world. Jesus often uses a, a method of comparison, of, uh, of comparing that which is lesser to that which is greater. So, so the point is, even if the world understands how to put money to work to make friends, how much more should those who are sons of the light recognize the temporary nature of monetary wealth and possessions and put it to work for eternal inheritance, eternal joy. Jesus uses this same method in Luke chapter six. We saw this last week in Luke 6, 32 to 35. Notice, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Don't pat yourself on the back when you do something supposedly kind that is emblematic of what the world will do anyway. Loving others who love you. Lending to those who you know will give back to you. Rather, demonstrate the fact that you belong to God. Demonstrate that there is a nature that is present in you, an empowerment of the Spirit that is helping you, that is helping you to represent God in a way that is different from the world. It's greater and better than the world. This principle of lesser to, to greater that we find throughout Jesus' teaching. And so as we come this morning to Luke chapter 16, verse 10, we find the, the, the further instruction that, that Jesus is building on when he's talking about stewardship and how good stewardship points and leads to heaven. Notice there in verse 10, first, good stewards are full of faith. Good stewards are full of faith. Notice, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Good stewards are full of faith. We get that from the very first part of verse 10. This word faith, or faithful, is the word pistos. It's, it happens throughout the New Testament, and the translation of that word depends upon the context because it's the same word. It means faith or faithful. The two are synonymous. The two are inseparable. We often tend to see them as different concepts, that faithfulness is different than faith. But in the New Testament, it's one and the same concept. To be faithful is to be full of faith, to show the true quality of faith that is in your heart. When we demonstrate faithfulness to God, we prove to ourselves, provide assurance in our hearts, 
that we actually belong to God and that our faith in God is genuine. Jesus continues throughout his ministry to to ascribe to this, to to teach this concept in Luke chapter 19, verse 17. This is the parable of talents when, when Jesus says to them, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. Then in Luke chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Are we faithful? Servants who trust God are faithful with that which has been entrusted to them the commands that God has given to them, the instructions of servanthood, carrying those duties out as faithful stewards to demonstrate they believe, in fact, that what their master says will happen. He is coming back. I don't know when, but I trust that he is true to his word. And so I want to be faithful with the things that he has given to me. They see that provision is from God. They, they recognize that, that their stewardship is, is a steward of all the good things that God has entrusted to them. And as we find in James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Good stewards recognize that every good gift they enjoy is a gift from God. Your home your family, your stuff, your clothes, your job, the things that God has given to you, those good gifts that are from him, are are, are gifts from God and are meant to be stewarded well. Our faithfulness to God's gifts are evidence of our faith in him. It shows that we believe that he is the source of every good thing. It, 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 it demonstrates that we enjoy the, the gifts that have come from him. And so we're gonna carry out God's objectives. We're gonna, we're gonna see them differently. We're going to recognize that we need to make friends for ourselves of heaven. Employ the, the possessions, the gifts, the, the things that God has granted to us and steward them well so that we can make friends for ourselves of heaven. How we steward God's good gifts really provide a window to your heart. Now, we understand understand faithfulness even in our shopping. (laughs) Any of you who have have used Amazon and have purchased things there, what is the first thing that you will do when you are trying to purchase a product? You're going to check out the reviews. (laughs) Exactly. It's exactly what you're going to do. And not just the product reviews because you want to make sure that that product is gonna meet your expectation, that's not gonna break in a couple of weeks from receiving it, that it's gonna do everything that you think it's supposed to do for the long haul. And then not only the reviews of that product, but also the review for the seller because you wanna make sure that that product isn't just what you want, but you're gonna actually get that product and you're not gonna be swindled in the process. And how many of you, how many of us, have been swindled in the process of purchasing things Sad to say, uh, I am one of those. We also recognize the Google reviews. You're gonna take your wife out on a great date and you're gonna check out and make sure that the restaurant that you've chosen has gotten good reviews. You're, you're gonna choose a doctor to oversee your health. You're, you're gonna make sure that doctor is meeting certain reviews. You need to find a contractor with, to do some home repair you want to find a mechanic to fix your car, you want to choose even a neighborhood to live in, you're looking at reviews, you're looking at the the word of mouth, you're hearing from others, you are testing the faithfulness of these individuals. Why? Because we know those who are faithful in little will be faithful in much. We we understand the concept, we we get it. And, And so if we understand the significance of this, We're not gonna entrust somebody to manage our portfolio, to fix our car, to teach our kids, to oversee our health, unless they have demonstrated good stewardship. So if this is the way the world operates, Jesus is saying how much more 
should a steward who represents God as a son of light should be stewards of the things that God has entrusted to him, the good gifts that God has given. Jesus then turns in the second part of verse 10, not from good stewards, he turns his attention now to bad stewards. We see in the second half of verse 10, bad stewards are unrighteous. Good stewards are full of faith, bad stewards are unrighteous. He says, one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. This Greek word is hadikas. It's a compound word. It has a at the front, which is not or without. And then it's followed by the word for righteousness or justice. So not righteous, not just. That's the quality of dishonest, wicked stewards. Now, right at the outset, we need to recognize there are times, even as believers, where we steward well, we demonstrate our faith in God, and other times where we don't steward well, and, and every time we choose not to steward well, we are choosing the path of not righteous. That's the significance. Just as we demonstrate our true faith through our faithfulness, We also demonstrate our lack of faith or our bankruptcy of righteousness, no righteousness by not stewarding well. A true disciple lives by faith. It shows up in his faithful stewardship. The immediate reaction is probably, well, I I am an honest steward. Everything that that I have, I've come by honestly. I've worked with integrity. I, I, I have managed my assets well. I, I've played by the rules. I, I, I've gone to work. I, I've done my job just the way I was supposed to. So, so everything I have, I have honestly. But recognize that Jesus is making a contrast here. This contrast of stewardship. There's only two options. You can either be faithful or unfaithful, honest or dishonest, a good steward or a bad one. Managing well or wasting possessions. It comes down to stewardship. So so what is the test of stewardship? Well, the test of stewardship is not how you get the money. The test of stewardship is how you steward the money, how you invest the money, how you share the money, how you use the money, the possessions, the gifts that God has entrusted to you to make friends of heaven, to invest in eternal purposes. So it's not how you get it. It's not how honest you are, and how, how much integrity you have when, when you get the, the good gifts that God has given to you. It's how you spend it. Now, of course, how you get it is also important. But when Jesus is talking about stewardship, he wants us to recognize how are you using, investing, sharing, putting to work the good gifts that God has entrusted to you? How do you distribute the money? How do you plan for eternity? How do you lay up treasures in heaven? How do you make friends of heaven? In other words, you are a faithful steward if you use the money entrusted to you to make friends of heaven. And thus you are a dishonest steward, a dishonest manager, an unrighteous manager if you take the good gifts that God has given to you and you spend it on yourself. You waste it in some way. You demonstrate there is this correlation that Jesus has made. Those who have wasted this this, uh, unrighteous steward who has wasted his master's possessions, we, we saw it's the same word that was given to the prodigal who squandered his father's money. You're just that wicked. And I'll just put myself here. Whenever... I choose not to steward God's money, God's possessions, and, do, and not do it, do it well. I demonstrate a heart of a prodigal. And we know that Jesus is designing the prodigal son to be the worst possible sinner that could have ever been imagined. And, and, and so I fit in that category when I choose not to use the good gifts that God has given to me in ways that represent the stewardship that I've been given. I want to just pause for a moment and, um, and, and just make mention of the fact that, that in this fellowship, many of you steward God's money very well. You are, you are great examples 
to me and to the rest of us of how to be generous, of how to lay up treasures in heaven, of how to invest in kingdom purposes, how not to stockpile in this life. And so I'm encouraged that at Maranatha Baptist, we have so many who do this so well. And so for the rest of us, myself included, God is calling us to think more deeply, more seriously about the good things that he's given to us so that we can reflect the true nature of who we are. Jesus' words are always hard in a postmodern culture where truth is relative, where definitive statements are really polarizing, where we resent accountability and we justify our sin. We want to reinterpret the scripture to, to fill our own purposes and to kind of meet our own scenarios, our own conditions. But, but Jesus is emphatic here. Let me repeat. Stewardship is not how you get the money. Stewardship is how you put God's money, God's possessions, God's goods, gifts to work. Using it, investing it, stewarding it. You are not the owner. You are a steward of God's good gifts. In verses 11 and 12, Jesus now transitions and, and now he's upping the ante, as it were. He, he's making it even more significant because he, now he, he wants to point stewardship to eternity because stewards should consider eternity. There is ultimate accountability in how you steward God's good gifts here in the here and now will indicate whether or not there is a future for you in heaven at all. Notice in verse 11, if you then have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Throughout this parable, Jesus again has been making these, these contrasts between sons in the world and the sons of light, between friends of unrighteous wealth and friends in eternal dwellings, between the here and now and some time in eternity between the physical and the spiritual, the temporal and eternal, between the honest and dishonest. Jesus is making these contrasts to help drive home the point. Which category do you belong in? Continuing this pattern, Jesus refers now to faithfulness with unrighteous wealth. What, what in the world does he mean by unrighteous wealth? Well, this word unrighteous is hadakas. It, it means not righteous. And here it doesn't mean that money is bad. It, it means that money has no moral quality to it. It's neither good nor bad, okay? But what, what, what makes it good is when we spend it or use it in a way that is making friends of heaven, investing in eternal things. Just like we find in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, Paul instructs, let the thief who stole, excuse me, let the thief no longer steal but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Here Paul commends good stewardship, good hard work so that this thief who was once a thief can now do what God has called him to do and that is to distribute, to share, to, to give, to lend, to help those who are around him, not to be a drag on society. But, but to recognize the, the privilege of stewardship in, in helping others around him. But money can also become bad when it's spent on selfish or wicked things. Like we find in 1 John chapter 3, verse, 20, uh, verse 17. If anyone has this world's goods, sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? If you have God's resources and God has blessed you with good things and you come to a place of recognizing that, that somebody in your fellowship, somebody in your spiritual family has a need and you choose rather to stockpile, you choose rather to withhold, you choose rather to, to, to build bigger barns as it were in the parable that we studied a few weeks ago. The question that John asks his audience if you don't recognize the importance, the significance of stewardship and how faithful stewardship points to true faith in God, then, then, then how can you ever call yourself a disciple of Christ? How can you ever call yourself a steward of God? How can you ever say that you're a Christian? It's not that 
giving money secures our salvation. It's that our stewardship of God's money provides assurance of what is true inside. It's the, it's the window, really, to your heart. It's the window to your affections. It's the window to, to the way you view what God has entrusted to you as a steward of, of God's good gifts. So, what are these true riches that we find in verse 11? Or what is the, that which is your own in, in verse 12? Notice the beginning of both of these verses are, are, are the same, are, are similar in nature. It says at the beginning of verse 11, if then you have not been faithful, and then at the beginning of verse 12, and if you have not been faithful, we recognize that it's talking about good stewardship, as Jesus has been talking about all along. But the parallel statements at the end of verse 11 is meant to be synonymous with the parallel statement at the end of verse 12. This true riches that he points to, who will entrust you with true riches in verse 11? And at the end of verse 12, if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? What, what is Jesus referring to? What, what in the world is he talking about? Of course, we understand again that Jesus is contrasting that which is physical with that which is eternal. That which is in the here and now versus that which is in the future. That which is earthly versus that which is in heaven. You can appreciate whatever Jesus is talking about is related to eternity. It's related to heaven. Something that's happening there. Early in, earlier in Jesus Christ's ministry, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus has a similar conversation about stewardship. In Luke 12, verse 22, he says this to his disciples. I would just encourage you to, to turn back a page or two in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12 and follow along. It says, And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will put on. Verse 28, But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? You notice? The things we get wrapped up about, things we get bent out of shape over, the things that occupy our attention, the things that are are essential, even the basic needs of life. Jesus is is addressing these. He's talking about the, don't think, don't care about your life. Don't don't think about what you're gonna put on. Don't don't think about what you're gonna eat or drink because those are the things that the world pursues. Those those are the things that occupy the attention of people who live here. But remember who God is. He's the one who clothes the grass. He's the one that, that even the, the flowers of the field weren't, weren't Solomon wasn't even arrayed like, like a flower of the field. And they're here today. They're gone tomorrow. And if God cares about the sparrows, how, how insignificant is a sparrow? But if God cares about the grass and God cares about the sparrows, don't you think God's gonna care about you? And so as we think about even the basics of life and, and stewarding those well. We don't need to be occupied about or, or, or frustrated or, or anxious about those things because God will provide for us in our ability to trust him, to provide in those ways, demonstrate, again, as we would imagine, a heart of faith, a heart that trusts him. But, but then Jesus goes on in, in Luke chapter um, 12, 28 and 32. Do not seek um, what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek the kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, the true riches, the true possession, the true inheritance. This is, this is what Jesus is referring to. This is what we look forward to. The hearts of those who consider themselves that are part of the flock of God have this to look forward to, have heaven and inheritance with God to look forward to. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's what's in store for you. And so for those of us who, who have that understanding, who, who recognize what, what's awaiting us in, in some future day, this eternal nature of the inheritance that we have with God in heaven. What will that do? Well, we find in verse 33 and 34 
of Luke chapter 12. So sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches, no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We show where our heart is, what we're looking forward to, what we're longing for, by where we invest, by the things that, the things that are important to us or the things that we invest in. And so if, if heaven is in our sights and, and we really believe that, that the true riches of God are, are waiting for us there, then all the investment that happens here is anticipating the wonder and the beauty of that great day of being with Christ in heaven. Finally, in verse 13, we find that stewards will show their loyalty. Stewards will show their loyalty. Notice Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Now now Jesus comes full circle to, to talk about this this dishonest manager who's wasted his master's possessions, this word that was synonymous with the prodigal. We know that the prodigal was lost. We know that the prodigal was unredeemed at the time. And the scenario that Jesus painted was in the minds of those who were listening to the story, they thought he was irredeemable. He was without hope. He was lost for good. Of course, we know the story of the prodigal coming to a place of recognizing his sin and and turning in repentance to his father and the father forgiving him. It was clear, though, that this prodigal, in this moment at least, was serving himself. He was living without accountability. He was pursuing his own interest. And, And so he could not be home. He could not be devoted to his father because he was devoted to himself. And that's Jesus' message here. No servant can serve two masters. Same was true of this dishonest master, this dishonest steward. He, he, he was using his master's stuff, but he was using it for his own benefit. He was squandering his master's uh, possessions for the sake of his own future, securing his own future. So what do we do with all of this? Where do we go? How does this lesson on stewardship resonate and become tangible in our own lives? That's what I want to just turn for a moment here at the end of our time. I want you to to recognize that Jesus was committed to in-home ministry. Jesus was committed to the in-home kind of ministry that was making friends of heaven. And there are a number of ways that we could talk about stewarding the possessions that God has given to us. I think probably automatically what comes to our mind is, is giving money to foreign missions or being involved in some sort of missionary venture or, or helping to assist those in our church who are in need. And, and those are all very good ways. But, but as I think about making friends for yourselves, we recognize that there must be a personal nature to this. I think it's easy for us to send money to some other place It may be easy for us to to pray once in a while, but but this isn't the kind of engagement that Jesus is talking about when he's talking about stewardship. He's talking about your personal commitment to press in and to make friends with the good gifts that God has given to you. One of the easiest ways to do that is through hospitality. Inviting people into your space, enjoying time with them, making friends, sharing your stuff, meeting needs, in sharing Christ with them through your message and through your life. How do we do this? Well, during the missions conference, we handed out this book. It's called The Simplest Way to Change the World. It's, it's a book about hospitality. If you do not have this book, we have several in the resource center. We'd be happy to, you can go back there and, and pick one up. I would encourage you to read this sometime in the summer or maybe just after summer. We're going to have a connect group to really press into this even more. But you you recognize and you know that the Bible consistently commends, challenges, encourages hospitality. And this was the life of of our Savior. 
a life of being in the homes of various individuals throughout his ministry. And the Gospel of Luke provides this tremendous picture of Jesus' ministry engagement in the home, sharing a meal. We find in Luke chapter 4, he's at Simon Peter's home. In Luke chapter 5, he's in Matthew's home. And on and on it goes, a Pharisee's home. Mary Martha's home, another Pharisee, talking about this future feast he's going to have in heaven, helping to commend, providing feasts, and inviting those who can't ever pay back. That's the principle that Jesus continues to commend because God has built into the fabric of who we are a need for relationship, a craving for friendship, a desire for community. Any of you who have watched uh, the show Alone will know that it has these individuals who, who go out and live in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness, or they've got to survive. The hardest part about living alone is not necessarily having to find resources to survive. It, it's the mental work of trying to be by yourself. Why? Because God has built us for a relationship. It's transcendent. Culture, culturally transcendent, generationally transcendent. And so we should capitalize on the resource that God has entrusted to us and press in to this very important, very strategic way of sharing Christ with others through hospitality. It's consistent with our core value to bless, bow, build, bless, and belong. This word bless, which is an acronym, living like Jesus to bless the world. So, so how do we do this? And, and you see there at the bottom of your, of your notes, I want to encourage you not just to leave the truth on the table. I want to encourage you to take the truth home, apply it to your life, make a plan. Because unless you make a plan, you're not going to likely, if you're like me, not likely going to do anything about it. So, so look on the calendar with your wife. Find a time where you're going to actually begin to be hospital. Make it a consistent part, consistent rhythm of your life and engaging the neighbors around you for the sake of making friends for yourself for heaven. This word bless, acronym, the first is begin to pray for your neighbors. Begin to pray for your neighbors. Uh, of course, you can't really pray for them knowledgeably without knowing who your neighbors are. Know your neighbors by name. Know the concerns that they have. Know the struggles they face. And that, that, that's consistent with this next one. Listen to your neighbors. Listen to them. Ask them good questions. Find out about their family. Recognize the, the heartaches that they have, the sorrows they carry, the, the joys that they're experiencing. Get to know who they are at a deeper level so you can pray for them knowledgeably, ask good questions, and, and generate or develop that friendship with them. The next is eat with your neighbor. Invite them over. Have coffee. And not just your neighbors. I would, I would include anybody in your school, kids. I would include anybody in your workplace, those people that you're rubbing shoulders with. Find ways to have informal, down-to-earth conversation getting to know who they are, extending yourself to them, building pathways of community and friendship. The first S is serve your neighbor. Find ways to get in their space that they are not uncomfortable with. <laughs> Whether you're checking their mail for them or you're walking their dog or you're shoveling their snow mowing their grass, fill in the blank, whatever it is, whatever is your sweet spot, as it were, in terms of ministry, find a way to serve your neighbors. Show them that it's not just about the agenda of sharing Christ, which, was, which is final here. Share the gospel with your neighbors. Recognize that it's more than just sharing the gospel. That is important, but it really is about extending the love, this overflow of all the good gifts that God has given to you are, are pouring out of your life and spilling out on the people around you. It's a part of stewardship. Whether or not they ever respond to the gospel, you are stewarding God's good gifts. You're doing it for him. You're not doing it for the results, as it were. We recognize that stewardship is important. We recognize that God has called us to this. 
And if you're anything like me, you recognize how poorly you do this, especially as it relates to neighbor kind of investment. I pray that God helps us all to grow in this area. I pray that God helps every one of us in this room, old and young alike, even you teenagers who are working. It starts now in learning how to steward God's good gifts in, in, in laying up treasure in heaven, in, in building friends that, that you're gonna meet, not just in school or in your community or on your soccer team, as it were, but, but listen to, the, to the, what's, what's happening here. This, these aren't just acquaintances that we have anymore. These are people we're gonna live next door to forever in heaven. At least that's the potential. These are forever friends. That's the goal of good stewardship of using God's good gifts, of making friends for ourselves in heaven, in heavenly dwellings. May God help us do better than we did last year. Oh God, thank you for this challenge that we find from your son, Jesus, as he taught his disciples. Lord, we recognize this principle of stewardship and we pray that you would help us to be faithful. We know that there's always room to grow and so God, I pray you wouldn't help us to leave discouraged but encouraged to do better, one step at a time. Lord, um, as we think about the strategic opportunities that we have to use the good gifts that you've given to us and then to invest those things so we can enjoy heavenly reward, God, I pray that you would just draw our attention to the significance of how this reflects our love for Jesus and how this this assures us of the authenticity of our faith. God, may we grow in all of these things. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good week.